And today we talk about, is there a possibility of evil? Or surely there must be evil, right? But when you first meet somebody, do you get vibes? I sometimes get vibes. You're like, well, I don't know about this person. I bet you people out there are getting vibes about me right now. My <laughs> name is Una, and welcome to the Codex Cantina. And I am Goody Two Shoe Crypto. And here on the Codex Cantina, we take a conversational approach to the literature that we read, bringing out some of the hidden meanings. If you're down for a discussion like that, hit that subscribe button to join us. And we'd like to thank all of our patrons that have joined us and supported us on this journey so far. And as always, we start off with publication information. The Possibility of Evil by Shirley Jackson was first published in December of 1968 in the Saturday Evening Post. We'll leave links down in the description where you can listen and read for free. What is one of her most popular stories? And much like the lottery, we start off in small town America. In normal Shirley Jackson fashion, I think there's a lot of different themes that we can talk about. One of them right off the bat is what is the definition of evil? That's obviously right there in the title. But I think there's a few other things of masking evil or the masks we wear, how we deceive ourselves in evil. Uh, and then there's a few other kind of small town things that are nestled in there. So what we do is we go through a quick plot summary to make sure we're all on the same page and then jump into some of the analysis and discussion of this. So for plot, in a small town lives Miss Adela Strangeworth, who has a wonderful rose garden with the sweetest smell. Her family has a prominent history in the town, and she views the town as her responsibility. As Miss Strangeworth goes about her day, she strikes up conversation with the various members of the town. Hearing how the children may not be hitting developmental milestones or how someone's always tired during the day, Miss Strangeworth has nothing but positive and reinforcing, encouraging things to say to their faces. <laughs> <laughs> she goes home and writes anonymous letters to her neighbors, which could be considered offensive, scathing. They're always based on more rumor than fact for what she writes to them. Now, one day, Miss Strangeworth is mailing her rumors, her letters out, and one of them doesn't make it into the mailbox. One of the local neighbors notices, picks up the letter, and delivers it to its intended recipient, thus exposing who has been writing the anonymous letters all along. The next morning, Miss Strangeworth wakes up, receives an anonymous letter stating, Look out at what used to be your roses. End plot. Oof, oof. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Well, what happened <laughs> you can to see the, the camera pan over there and zoom in. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's almost kind of like left on a cliffhanger that if you were to like dramatize this, you'd almost have her open the curtain and it would just zoom in and she would just look horrified and you'd never actually see what happened to the roses. Oh, yeah. So the camera would be looking in her maybe window above the sink and you see her reading this note and she looks over and yeah, you get the suspenseful music and it never shows you the rose beds. Yeah. That'd be good. So not new to Shirley Jackson, you will recognize immediately small town feel. For those of you that are either unfamiliar with that or maybe don't fully understand what America was like back then, um, everybody was in everybody's business, right? Everybody knew each other in small towns and to an extent that's still kind of true even to today's standards. And it gets that feel, that vibe, right, that when you're in small town America, the people, you act a certain cordial way to each other. And we see that with Mrs. Strangeworth of how she has these outward appearances and how she will treat people in public. But you don't go after somebody in public. You you don't call them out. It, you're, you're always very proper. And it has almost that southern feel to it as well. Now, Shirley Jackson loved name play. So immediately when you find out that the action's happening on a street called Pleasant Street, oh, you know it's going down. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's talk about Miss Strangeworth, right? Like that name, a strange worth, a strange sense of worth. And it's interesting the way that she kind of views herself, the way her interior is exposed in this piece. That was one of the big themes that I felt was overarching for this entire story is it's strange of what she saw as valuable, what was worthy of her that was good and bad. And 
I, I really felt like Jackson is trying to portray that sometimes what we think is important isn't necessarily important to someone else, and that these rumors can be detrimental to somebody. As we see at the end of the story, it's detrimental to her precious roses. And if she's the anti-gossip, I feel like her name should have been Miss Gossipy Bottom, like because she was in everybody's business. But it's interesting, <laughs> right. too, because a small town, right? People are opening up to each other. I'm worried about my baby. Like, oh, I'm so tired. Like, like things that you don't necessarily just hear from your butcher when you live in a big city like I do, right? And what Miss Strangeworth does is she takes these, these small things and then takes a different perspective on them. Right, she takes almost like this maybe evil perspective. She invents stories and causes it to just jab this in this knife of insecurity into her townmates' hearts, if you will. Right, we have that quote where they say, "Miss Strangeworth never concerned herself with facts. Her letters all dealt with the more negotiable stuff of suspicion," which makes me wonder. Is she doing this on purpose? Do we think Miss Strangeworth is trying to be malicious with these warnings and these letters of insecurities? There is, I think, some maliciousness to this because when she writes the letters in the story, it says, although Mrs. Strangeworth's desk held trimmed quill pen and a gold frosted fountain pen, Mrs. Strangeworth always used a dull stub of pencil when she wrote her letters and she printed them in a childish block print. So she's not doing this kindly in this because, you know, this lady has beautiful cursive penmanship and the letter could be embossed and she could put it with, you know, a stamp with beautiful wax and has a nice little picture. No, she's making this look crummy on purpose to denote what her intention is. Mm, I can see that. Do you think do you think she has good in her? Like, do we think Do we think evil is the true her and she masks herself when she's out in public? Or do we think there's two sides to her, whether she maybe she is and wants to connect with people and takes on like almost a role of protector of the town, but also has that negative side too, where she's she's picking away at the devil's thoughts of saying, like, oh, have you thought about this? And just comes up with these really insecure, evilish type things to say. In real life, we view ourselves when you look in the mirror you see something and other people see you i think for mrs strangeworth she sees herself as the protector of the town and that she's rooting out maybe this this little bit of evil and that she sees herself as doing good deeds by taking something that is tiny and minuscule some but she knows is actually a bigger problem in her view in her view do you think her responsibility the town comes from the heritage you know, we always have those ideas of, well, my da- my great granddaddy built this town, right? So you almost take it on as a status symbol, right? You're something special to the community, and particularly in the olden days, the good old boys, right? The people that could never get in trouble because of their status, because of who they knew. Is Miss Strangeworth perhaps representing that old town mentality of, I'm in a protected class, and it's my responsibility to guide all you other folks to better lives? 100 percent this if this was a show or a movie and somebody new came in she'd walk up and be like this is my hair town and this is how we do it <laughs> she does see herself as the protector her grandfather you know built the town and he started off this status of that we are the ones that you should be thankful for and she doesn't have that status symbol anymore but in her heart she still does so she's thinking maybe I can do it in another directive or way by maybe not saving the town monetarily, but I can save them morally. Mm. You know, another thing that she's constantly surrounded with in the story is the smell of those sweet roses and stuff like that. How did you take the roses in the story and what did you think they meant? Ooh, the roses are tricky, right? Because uh, you look at a rose and it's all beautiful on the outside, but when you get close, they has those uh, you know, prickly thorns. So it can be dangerous. Uh, so good and bad. Maybe they're the the dichotomy. And just like Mrs. Strainsworth, she has the outwardly beautiful appearance, but she's kind of prickly underneath. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the duality in this story is what is kind duality. of the main thrust. And we see that even with even Miss Strangeworth and the town, right? There's the two sides. You have Miss Strangeworth, and then there's this invisible line where her conflict 
is it really with herself or is her conflict with the town maybe? And maybe there's just two different sides to it in the same way that there's two different sides to a rose. You have the sweet, beautiful smelling side and then you have the thorn side of don't walk through the rose bush because it's going to hurt. <laughs> and I think it's her truth. It's what she believes is wrong with these people when they're complaining about their kid and uh, when they're complaining about being tired and what she does to the doctor. I mean, that really does have real world consequences. She, she is literally making a difference in her town. She just thinks it's a positive thing when it could be detrimental like those thorns because yeah. it does hurt people's feelings and maybe somebody could lose their job over this. Um, and, and she's very much a hypocrite as well. And we hadn't mentioned that. At least I felt like she was a hypocrite. She, you know, is very mean to the young man in the store. Be like, hey, you should know what I, I order. I get this every single Tuesday. But then she's like, oh, it's okay if your baby acts crazy. That's just how people are. Be like, well, th that doesn't make any sense. You're being a hypocrite here, Mrs. Strainsworth. Yeah, she has two sides to her in the same way that she has the beautiful quill with the white paper for the nice things and like, you know, maybe things that she needs to do. And then there's the rumor side of her, the colored paper with the worn down pencil that says mean blockish things to say. So I, I definitely appreciate the way Shirley Jackson kind of has these two sides to everyone in the town, the good and the evil. But it comes down to your point that you were just mentioning earlier of it, does she really mean to cause evil? Right, we have that quote, as long as evil existed unchecked in the world, it was Miss Strangeworth's duty to keep her town alert to it. Which means Miss Strangeworth believes she's alerting other people of evil. She's making sure that they know the things they need to steer clear of. But she doesn't recognize that potentially she might be causing harm. She might be not intentionally malicious, but she might be offending people when it doesn't actually have a true benefit. So I guess that poses the question, what is evil in the story? In this story, I think it's point of view. In this story, I think there's an argument to be made that she is doing this a little bit maliciously and that she gets a little bit of joy of exposing these evils, mm. even though she feels like she's doing the right thing. It's definitely POV. It, it, it's point of view. Uh, and that, that's with a lot of things maybe in life is from your perspective, something looks evil where it looks good to somebody else. Yeah. Well, guys, we're going to leave a playlist down below with other Shirley Jackson talks if you would like to check them out. Let's move into our subjective wrap up and ratings. Crypto, what are you going to give this one? I'm going to give this one a solid seven. I don't think it is anywhere near as awesome as the lottery. I think that one just has a lot more depth to it. This one's pretty straightforward. I think that... Uh, if you were using this in class, it could be a, a nice discussion piece on what is evil, and that could maybe lead to its own set of questions and debates. Uh, but that, and there's some duality here and things and how we mask ourselves. And there are some talking points, and I, I like some of the themes, but it, it, I don't know, there was maybe one kind of funny little part to it. I just, it, it, for some reason, I didn't feel this one hit me like, like the lottery did. I don't know. There wasn't as much as motion involved, maybe because I didn't like Mrs. Strangeworth. I mean, you're not supposed to like her, I think. I don't know. Maybe that says more about me. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I I don't know if I would make the comment based on the complexity of the stories. I just think for me, this one didn't resonate as well with me. I live in a bigger city, though. I do love that 50s, 60s mentality and feel of the story. So I'm going to go with the seven as well. I thought it was pretty good, pretty good, but just wasn't wasn't the lottery to get my, my engine going, if you will. So guys, we post videos every Monday and Thursday, and we certainly appreciate you spending some time with us today. Hit that subscribe button if you'd like to join us in some more conversational approaches to literature. Una out. Peace.